Dr. John Cohen, I found her. <laughs> I found her, Dr. John Cohen. <laughs> we have one seat. Front row, one seat here, two seats here, one seat here, Three. down to one seat here, one seat here, two seats in the back, you can sit together, two seats over here, one seat over here, two and two. And one, thank you for raising your hands to show us where the seats are. And one.
Hi, people in the back. People in the back, we have seats. You can sit. Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, okay. I at least I had one good morning. I'll just wait till it gets, or I can do the quiet thing. But that works. Hi, my name is Deborah Kiak Franson. I'm the Associate Vice President for Digital Education and Engagement at the University of Colorado System. It's my enormous pleasure to be here welcoming you today. This is our ninth rendition of Cult, and I forgot to count how many, um, what nth, nth it is, the umpteenth. I think we're getting close to 15, 16th, um, 19th. Is it that big? Wow. Okay, so next year is the 10th anniversary of the resuscitated cult, which sounds bad when I say it like that, so I'll stop saying that. <laughs> so, um, so we have hopes for you for this conference. Um, we actually have learning objectives, um, and they are twofold. One is that you will learn one thing that will change your heart, your mind, or your behavior. That's it, just one thing. So we hope you go out and find that. Um, the second thing is we hope that you meet one person that you don't think you would have otherwise met and make plans to meet with them after. So we can continue to build this cult community throughout the year and throughout the state and the region. Um, we've got some new things this year. For those of you who have found Idea Forge, um, it's just steps away, don't be afraid. So if it says Idea Forge and it doesn't say Wolf Law, you can make it there, we promise you. Um, so you can just walk there. We've got the Commons and the Classroom over there. Those are two new spaces. Um, don't forget Test Kitchen is upstairs during the afternoon breaks. These are five minute recipes of technology. You will find the people because there are Klieg lights and bi a big, big, big hat. Um, and then what else do we have? Oh, uh, our vendors. Uh, we've got vendors upstairs who make a cult possible through their participation and um, a slightly larger registration fee for them. Please do go hear what they've got to say and to um, incentivize you to do that. We've got a gamification of cult this year through your uh, Zarista app. So you'll get points for coming to the keynote, um, for going to a session. And at the end of tomorrow, the top scorers will win a prize. Um, uh, and then if you have questions about that, ask one of our staff members. You can find our staff members. They they wear, um, they've got the nice Colt bandanas or the Colt hats. Um, and so that's it for what's going on. I should say thank you. Um, and I want to say thank you to the many people who have made this possible. Um, first of all, the, the CU folks from the Office of Academic Affairs. We've got Jill and Darren and Mike back there. So if you guys can all wave, they make it all possible. Thank you very much. And of course, we have our cult staff, um, Chloe and Isaac, our students who have been doing a remarkable job. And then Jamie, if you could please stand up. We could not do this without our director. Um, I'd also like to thank our program committee. And this year, um, we've got, and I'll have them stand up in a second. I'm going to show off because we have presents for them. Um, and. <laughs>
Last night, I could do one round before, and so I'm feeling very good about my learning. Um, so cult program committee, up here, we have for you your own trick rope and um, a Will Rogers rope trick book for you. So next year, we hope to have you all doing that. So program committee members, could you please stand, because you are just the awesomest. And now it's an honor to present Dr. Brenda J. Allen. Um, it, it, I can't tell you how she leads um, in her discipline and at the university. She is the vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion and the chief diversity officer at the University of Colorado, Denver. She's described online as being innovative, as having a flair, um, as being groundbreaking, as providing leadership in this area. And what Brenda's going to do for us today is start the conversation. So what we have noticed is that we have discussions about diversity and inclusion over here and about technology over here. So for the first time, I think, in, at least in cult history, we're going to bring those two conversations together. Like that. <laughs> like so. <laughs> and um, as a spur of the moment decision, Brenda and I decided a few minutes ago that we were going to continue this discussion by opening up an online forum. We're probably going to build that in Canvas. If you have suggestions or time, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so that we can continue collecting resources in this area, continue the discussion, and to continue the way we do business. So she's going to start us off um, by getting us to think a little bit differently. So please help me welcome Brenda J. Allen. Is that all you have for me this morning? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you, because without you, I would not be here doing this. If you all know Deb, she gets an idea. She's determined. I wasn't so sure I wanted to do this. She was very energetic and said, come on, please, please, please. I'll do anything for you. So I won't tell you what I'm going to get. <laughs> Woo! You know, they say women don't ask. I knew what to ask for. <laughs> so all jokes aside, thank you so very much. And thanks to Jamie and everyone else who has really made this a pleasure and an honor for me. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here with you this morning to talk about optimizing technologies promise. And one of the things you'll notice through the slides is I've done, uh, I've pulled some slides that will be very familiar to many of us. For some of you, it may be, hey, what's that, right? Because it really helps us to, I hope, remember that we've come a long way and also to know that um, 10 years from now, there'll be a, probably a slew of other kinds of technologies. So again, the topic for today is optimizing Technologies promise. Uh, in 1989, which was how many years ago, math majors or others? 1989 was what? Come on. 27 years ago, around this time, I had just relocated from Washington, D.C., Howard University, to CU Boulder here. And in fact, my apartment was right up on South Boulder Road. Every time I come down here, I remember, have fond memories of that. Uh, I was recruited as a twofer. Anyone know what that is? <laughs> Colored and curved. Okay. <laughs> Bam. Um, so I was recruited because the university really was concerned in terms of diversity. At that time, I was uh, ABD, all but the dissertation. I was teaching as a lecturer full time at Howard University. And the course I was teaching was called Computers and Society. And this was a course in their Comprehensive Sciences Department. And it was for all of their majors. It was a course that was designed to help them understand that computers matter in the world. And so one of the things I was doing in that course was teaching basic. Anyone remember that language, <laughs> basic, right? And I actually was teaching it two steps ahead of my students. I was 
teaching myself and then teaching them. But I was also talking with them about the importance of, of uh, computers to society. In addition, I was completing my dissertation at Howard University in the broad umbrella of organizational communication. And to do that, I was doing a study at PBS's corporate headquarters in Virginia, where I was interested in how do organizations adopt new computer-mediated communication technologies. And they just had adopted a uh, technology that I was intrigued in terms of, is there a relationship between an organization's culture and how they use these new media? And the, the new technology I was studying was, wait for it, wait for it, electronic mail. <laughs> so I came here completing that research discovering that indeed there was a relationship between PBS's culture, what it intends to do, and how they were actually adapting those technologies. And so I came here to teach and continue to do research, scholarship, et cetera, in that area. However, I got here and I was intrigued by dynamics related to my identity and others, especially in terms of race and gender separately and combined, to the extent that uh, as I came up for tenure, I changed my area of scholarship to do the work that I now do. I've remained a geek. Um, you know, I have this. I also have my brand new iPad with the pen, pencil, right? Um, I have who knows how many iterations of iPhones, et cetera. I try to stay ahead. So um, I'm very excited to then talk with you this morning because what I did in my tenure dossier, I had to justify they would see that I had two different things going on. And so I did some retrospective sense making and I said, so I am a scholar of organizational communication for the 21st century who looks at two significant issues facing organizations, diversity and technology. I also said that I, as I got tenure, and I said it like that, um, <laughs> as I, once I got tenure, then I would actually look at how those converge. And I haven't actually done that as research and scholarship. However, I have in various things that I do, I've done that. So this invitation has led me to realize we, we really, really need to do that. So the point of our conversation today is indeed to think about how do we really work towards converging diversity and technology in service of tech, uh, where we are in society. So what I hope is that by the end of our time together, you will be inspired, you will be informed, and you will be ready to take action in terms of optimizing the promise of technology for what we can do in higher education for the betterment, frankly, of our world. So you ready to do that? Yeah. I can't hear you. Are you ready? OK, excellent. So what I'm going to do is first just really clarify our terms, after which I'll talk a bit about the past very, very briefly, then talk about where are we now and where might we be headed. And as we go through this, I want you to be thinking and feeling about possibilities. We don't have much time together, so most of the topics that we will uh, explore in and of themselves could merit an entire class, right? Not to mention maybe a longer session, but that's okay. As you've heard, we're just beginning this conversation. So um, first of all, what is that technology on that slide? Hello, I'm not joking. What is it? Oh, somebody knows exactly. What is it? 16 millimeter film. And fond memories of being in, as a student being in classes and the sound of that and they had to turn the lights down. And so it's just really kind of fascinating to reflect for those of us who can remember. So with that said, <laughs> Not just can remember, but had that memory. Whoa. Yeah, that was a nice Freudian slip, too. I remember that when I get to the graying of the professoriate, all right? A little later on in our talk. So the first thing to think about is um, how do we define technology? And um, as I was teaching, I really relied on that course I relied on a definition from Marshall McLuhan. Any of you know Marshall McLuhan? Media theorist, really uh, actually kind of predicted the World Wide Web, uh, et cetera. And so I used to use 
his definition, and some of you may know it, of technology, which he will now share with you, and I want us to use as a framework for our time together. So. what it's you mean up. in the context of your argument by this word. I try not to have any private meanings, Frank, but uh, <laughs> I, I think of said. technologies you as uh, extensions yes. of our own bodies, of our own faculties. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm glad it's you and not me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Here for you always. Uh, Marshall, we're going to be using the word technology probably rather a lot in this conversation, so could we start by asking you exactly what you mean in the context of your argument by this word? I try not to have any private meanings, Frank, but uh, I think of technologies as uh, extensions of our own bodies, of our own faculties, the uh, whether clothing, housing, and uh, more uh, familiar kinds of technologies like wheels, stirrups, such extensions of various parts of the body. The um, need to amplify the human powers in order to cope with various environments brings on this, these extensions, uh, whether of tools or furniture, uh, these amplifications of our powers, sorts of deifications of man, uh, I think of as technologies. Okay, so you heard what he said, that, and, and uh, Marshall, I found in working, with, in working with students, and also for my own purposes, this notion of thinking of technologies as extensions of ourselves. So I would say things like our eyeglasses are extensions of how we can see. And certainly now, all the kinds of technologies, we tend to conflate, and we say technology, with electronic or digital. And I think that's important, but I also am intrigued by, especially in thinking about convergence of diversity and inclusion with thinking about technologies, is what kinds of ways are we extending, and what, based on what in terms of our own embodiments, in terms of our own priorities. So technology also means, um, in terms of the, its etymology, it's from the Greek, and it actually talks about um, ways that we systematically engage with the world. So that's what we mean then for today in terms of technology. And, and of course, with the title being optimizing, what does it mean to optimize? Anyone? Full potential? Optimize. Enhance, Enhance right? Make the most of, okay? So making the most of technology, that notion of extensions of cells, that notion of systematically um, engaging. And the next thing to think about is what are the, you all know what that is? Does everybody know? Anybody who may not know? You wouldn't admit it, huh? It's okay. It's really okay. <laughs> what is it? I know, I looked for one of those, like the real, like, yeah. <laughs> you have them still. <laughs> so the question now is, what are the promises? Because if we're talking about optimizing the promise of technology, it's important to get some clarity on what we believe those to be. So I want you all to, first of all, take about 30 seconds to just think about, well, especially in the think past, present, and future, right? For any of you who have been thinking and working on these issues uh, for a while, I know I have, and I hearken back to those classes in terms of what we were thinking, in terms of even calling it the super information, the information superhighway, right? That there were intentions around, wow, this is so exciting in terms of what it can accomplish. So what were and are those promises? I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it, and then I want you to turn to a partner and really just brainstorm. You know how brainstorm works. You're not having a conversation. You're just listing, okay? And I'll give you one minute for that. So first, I just took your 30 seconds, so no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I'll give you about 10 seconds, because probably you know how beautifully most of our minds work as you've begun to think about it anyway. So I'll give you about 10 seconds, and then turn to a partner and just brainstorm, make a list of what are the kinds of promises then and now of technology.
Okay, that was about 10 seconds, but I hope that's enough. Go. So, couldn't think of anything, could you? <laughs> I love the energy in the room, and of course we have technology where I could have captured that, captured that from you, even as, bless you, I appreciate opportunities like this to actually feel the energy in the room, to optimize that we are face-to-face -face and so forth, so that, you know, the idea becomes what kinds of, quote, technologies are we using? What media do we use for particular things in our learning and teaching? And in this case, the medium of you know, face-to-face -face communication, optimizing that. However, it would have been nice to capture all the kinds of reasons that you came up with in terms of promises of technology. I'll tell you some that I think are especially significant for our topic today. And that is that um, the transformative potential of technology. Technology actually being able to transform our world. And I'm reminded in particular of a, of a quote in the book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Any of you familiar with that? By Paulo Freire. And it's actually a quote that's been attributed to him that I recently learned is actually the foreword author made that quote where he basically talks about education either uh, maintaining the status quo and bringing about conformity or helping our students to contribute to transforming the world, to being creative, to having agency. And I believe that technology has that potential, but we can't acquire that potential until and if we actually tap into it. So transforming, personalizing, teaching and learning, um, putting students in control of their own learning, uh, taking our schools and our education out of the industrial age, which we, there's still a ways to go in that regard, and to better prepare all of us for rapidly changing global uh, economy, ways of being in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And to help us in terms of making our teaching and training and our own learning much more efficient. So I think to something as simple as my old grade book, right? Where I meticulously would write the names and write down the scores and so forth. So just thinking along those lines about those extensions and how technology can help us in any number of ways. Um, a, a quote that I, and of course, access to more and more information and data, uh, the potential to break educational boundaries, the potential to provide access to growth and learning to literally everyone. And yet we have a long way to go in terms of accomplishing that potential, but those are phenomenal promises. And I found a quote by Dr. Jamie Lathan, who is the Dean of Distance Education and External Programs at a magnet school in North Carolina. And he said that technology, quote, makes learning and teaching more flexible and accommodating and makes up for deficiencies in the society. So phenomenal promises, right? However, there are also many barriers in terms of how we can achieve those promises. And again, if I had time, I'd invite you to share with one another some of the barriers. And I'm nowhere near claiming through what I'm gonna share with you now that these are all of the barriers. But again, I think these are the ones we need to especially be aware of. And I uh, recall the kinds of things that I talk with specifically in teaching those classes, as well as, as I was con completing my doctoral research of looking at, right, how do I analyze 
Uh, it actually was a triangulated study where I first did interviews, sample, selected sample across the levels of the organization, then I designed a survey, and then I came back and did a percentage of those interviews to do a uh, check-in in terms of you know, what I found. But some of the theories that I referred to included social presence theory, you're familiar with that, in terms of warmth or cold, the degree to which a technology allows you to have a sense that someone is actually present there. And in teaching and doing that research, we talked a lot about the notion that we still do of access. However, we talked about access in a, in a number of ways, which again, are still, uh, we're still having those conversations of physical, of psychological, right? Access, of course, assumes that someone knows that tech exists and what it offers. Someone has the propensity and the curiosity to discover and use it wisely. And sometimes we say, well, our students, they have this technology, but that does not guarantee at all in terms of how they're using it, nor does it mean for any of us as faculty and staff that we may be on campuses or institutions who have mwah, cutting edge some of the best technologies, but if we don't really know how to use it, if we're not also right inclined to use it, if for whatever reason we haven't really um, tapped into the idea that this can be extensions of ourselves in a particular way and so forth, then that can be a challenge. And so access is important to think about the cultural context, and with culture meaning so many different kinds of things, with socioeconomic resources, with technical knowledge, psychological skills, all needed for effectual use of information and communication technologies, along with cognitive and temporal kinds of challenges or limitations. Blogger uh, Maria Popova, has anyone read her? really awesome. I just found her, and again, thank you for this opportunity for me to learn and grow. But she's a cultural critic, and she elaborates by talking about barriers of awareness, which encompass all the information we can't access because we simply don't know about it, its existence in the first place. We don't even know that it exists. And for me, that's not just information, but it's the kinds of technology and tools that one might actually employ. So she adds to this a third barrier, a barrier of motivation, right? Which is relevant not only to information, but again, to whether we approach or avoid technology, what kinds of technologies. I just had the pleasure of doing a week-long seminar with um, relatively um, new, younger communication faculty, week-long institute at uh, Hope College in Holland, Michigan. And one of the older faculty members was saying, well, I make the students check their cell phones at the door um, because they don't need to be accessing that technology. And I said, what if, right, we engaged with them in terms of, first of all, learning more about how they're using, but it's a kind of meeting of the minds of our understandings maybe of critical thinking, of how you use, et cetera, et cetera, along with what are they using, rather than this kind of tendency to maybe resist or shut out all together. So also while I was there, one of the younger faculty members persuaded me to get Pokemon Go. And, <laughs> and I loved it. And in fact, when I got home, I deleted it because I said, this will not control my life. <laughs> However, what was fascinating about it was just the kind of thing that I try to encourage my colleagues with. And so I try to do a feedback loop for myself when I want to offer advice and guidance, is if you really don't know what it's about, you can't critique or judge it uh, appropriately. So what I was surprised about with Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go is being on that college campus, first of all, so they were everywhere, all kinds, but also there were so many landmarks and so much information where if you want to get, some of you may know if you want to get the balls that you can use to capture if there's a, a monument or a statue or whatever, information that I can see, and, and I'm, I'm not daring to think that you know this is innovative, I just hope people are doing it. And I also just want to offer this as an example that that could be an educational tool, right? Um, and I'm concerned that many of the persons who are using it aren't aware of that. Right? That they're so focused on getting points or you know, walking around to do this that they're missing it. And that's a way that I think that's an idea of ways that we can collaborate 
right, across our kinds of understandings about technology. So that's a bit in terms of barriers, um, as again, just with most of these topics, uh, just really touching the surface, hoping to give you, again, inspire you, give you some information about how we might go forward. So what do you see there that's familiar in terms of teaching and learning technology? <laughs> so as I was doing this, I actually started rummaging around in some of my old files and found these, oh, I love doing that, you see. Um, these beautiful transparencies. And, and when, I, when I figured out how to do transparencies and use color ink, right, I just knew I had it going on, right? Uh, so it's just, again, fascinating to reflect on the kinds of ways we've used teaching and learning technologies. Any, everybody know what transparencies are? <laughs> or somebody, some of us know. And again, it's okay if you don't because it suggests that that was, you know, that's outdated, if you will, or, or technology that's before you began to use and have technology used for you. So those are barriers. I also think it's important for us to think about, now I know you know all of those, right? But even looking at those, some of them are like totally passe. I, I got one of the first Kindles and I ran across it the other day. I was like, mm, really? Um, <laughs> and yeah, when I got it, I was like so geeked. It's like, I could read books, you know. <laughs> I can get on the internet with these teeny little, but anyway, no judgment. Um, so the question is, why should we try to optimize, right? We've talked about what is technology, uh, the notion of optimizing, what are the promises, right? But I just want to take a moment in terms of thinking, not only in terms of why should we should try, but what's at stake and who are the stakeholders. So again, with, with uh, limited time, with perhaps a question that seems you know, pretty general and it's okay, because again, this is a, an opening of a conversation. What's at stake? Who are the stakeholders? Why should we really, really do much better than we're currently doing? Anyone wanna share for the group? For answering to any of those questions. Yes, and your name is? Tony. Tony, that's right, hey. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, you know, Tony, that really, we can go deeper than that, and yet that fully captures it. The idea that we owe it to ourselves and to our students, right? And that's our current and prospective students. And that's our, who we are as faculty and staff, as well as our prospective faculty and staff, right? So all of us are stakeholders. All of our families as students, faculty and staff, the rest of the world, across their lives, and so forth. And actually, I think I really am going to stop at that understanding that we could possibly go a bit deeper. We could think about things that actually we will touch upon a bit later in terms of some of the challenges and trends in higher ed, which really point out that we owe it, right? And we owe it because of challenges. We owe it because of urgencies that if we don't address them, I don't know what can happen to higher ed overall. I don't know what can happen in terms of our world. Yes. Hi, Candace. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm Candace. How about a competitive advantage? Exactly. There's a lot of competition Period. in ed higher ed. That's right. Competitive advantage both for our institutions, respectively, as well as globally even as the U.S. continues in many ways to be a leader in higher education. So thank you, Candace, for that additional part in terms of how we owe it. Yes, one moment where, where, while we get the mic, please. And you are? <laughs> uh, I'm Steve. Hi, and Steve. Um, another reason we want to optimize our use of technology is because we have limited resources to put toward this solution and we want to make sure that the money and the effort we spend is 
um, most efficiently used. Excellent point that as we think about what it will take, right, and as we recognize the responsibility, we've got to be thoughtful about why we're doing it and how we're doing it as efficiently as possible. I want to take one more, please. I'll do two more then. Start here and then come down and, and then we'll move forward in terms of the conversation. Yes, you are? My name is Jen. Hi, uh, Jen. Hey, we'll never get out of the industrial model of education if we don't look at what we have for technology yes. and where we're going. Yes, excellent point. We will stay stuck, right? And being stuck is challenging. Being stuck is problematic. Being stuck is actually kind of unacceptable. Given that, one of the things I want you to be sure to take away from our time together, you may know it already, is we have the tools, we have the know-how, we have the theories, we have the promising practices, we have the emergent practices, we have people who are ready, willing, and able to do this. We just have to get it all together. One more, please. Uh, Paymon from Coursera. Um, I, I'm going to be a little patriotic here, but we, we as a nation aspire so admirably to be a place of equal opportunity, and we state that our public education system should be the equalizer, but yes. uh, we all know that our the color of one's skin, the thickness of one's wallet does so much to dictate life circumstance in our country. And so I think because of that, it behooves us to aspire to that vision of our nation. Thank you very much. On that note, let's give an applause for everyone who weighed in. <laughs> Recognizing that you know, we could deepen this conversation even more, but this contributes so well to, again, our exploration of how to optimize technology's promise, how and why. And so from there, let's take a look at the past. And can you believe that as I was going through some of my materials, I found a photo of me at one of the earliest technologies, which was the chalkboard. <laughs> And so I'm very pleased, would you believe I found that photo of myself? And as I thought about it, I remember going into classrooms and just hoping there'd be chalk there. And I think I was like, why didn't you just buy some chalk, right? <laughs> just after the fact. But I also got so excited when they made big fat chalk, right? So that chalk was like an extension of my big hands so that I could grasp it easier. So anyway, now let's take a look very briefly at the past. And as I said, would you believe I found a photo of me at the chalkboard? <laughs> Though the Boulder Sun, you know, has really done a lot for me. <laughs> How many days of a year? <laughs> but the idea that past is prologue, the idea that um, those who don't look at the past are what? doomed to repeat it. And so this is not ever, however, saying we totally throw away and disregard the past. Indeed, I think part of what we should be trying to do for those of us who have those memories of the past is to integrate and bridge it into the present and the future, right? So I think that that's really very important. I also, however, want us to think again briefly about what kinds of things were so for the three particular points we're focusing on today. The status of higher ed, and then uh, what was so in terms of teaching and learning technology, and what was so in terms of thinking about diversity and inclusion. And certainly for the most part across the history of higher education, um, in terms of the purpose, uh, originally relatively elitist, right, um, that, that changed across time, also in terms of who particular were students, faculty, and staff, pretty heterogeneous in terms of race and ethnicity and gender and social class, with changes across all of those. In terms of teaching and learning technology versus probably just called technology, right, maybe technology used for teaching. Also, um, I would imagine, well, my, my sense is that even thinking about teaching as an endeavor, very little formal, formal training about how to do teaching. And in fact, that persists. I mean, it's kind of spotty in terms of whether or not if you're a faculty member, you've had any kind of formal training or professional development around teaching 
whether you were a graduate teaching assistant, whether it was somehow required as part of your job. And certainly very, very little in terms of how do you engage and interact effectively with diverse student body. So again, that's kind of like just in a nutshell of thinking about what was so were the particular points that we're addressing today. I now want to move forward and talk about some challenges. So what's that? Anybody know what that is? So first of all, does anybody not know what that is? Raise your hand, it's okay. All right. <laughs> and so those of you who do know it, does this sound familiar? <laughs> right? So one of the things that's missing from some of our current technology are all the kinds of sounds and smells. I even remembered mimeograph, anyone? Remember how that smelled, right? Anyone not know what mimeograph is? It's, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> We're with you. We're going to stay with you all day. Um, so just right, some of the distinctions of the kinds of memories uh, related to these. Although now with this, you know, tactile is pretty cool, pretty kind of awesome. So in terms of challenges, also want to think about challenges as opportunities. And again, opportunities related to the status of higher education, the compositions and predispositions of students and faculty and staff, as well as what kind of tech advances. And as I share this with you, I think you've been doing it already because I can kind of read minds a little bit, um, is thinking about so what, right? So one of the things I often invite is to say, what have we covered? So what, right? What are the implications? Now what? What can we do? So as I share these, I want you to be thinking along those lines. And I, I'll, again, foreground some that I think are especially salient and significant, conceding that others exist, and that each topic is richly complex and merits its own focus. So now let's talk about the status of higher education. Um, I love technology because it's almost as if you know, there is, you know, a mind reader or something. So oftentimes when I'm looking for something, it's sort of like it appears. I do a certain kind of search and voila. Or I, you know, I'm on a list where people are sending me things. So the Chronicle, if you haven't seen it, I think it was just last week, had published this report called 2026, the decade ahead. That is so timely for us today. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. They talk about a few things. Again, I'm just going to highlight some. One includes the surge in enrollment in the past four decades, with the perceiving a college degree as a ticket to financial success, with the need for us to have a more educated citizenry. However, there's a higher number of dropouts. There's also a decline in terms of grad school enrollment, which is up only because of international students. Um, as you know, President Obama asked for a tool, college scorecard, to calculate the return on investment. And the notion of college rankings has become more and more important. Public and policy demand for better information regarding that return on education. And Colorado is one of seven states that is matching statewide salary data to see, right, what school you went to, what kind of job you have, what kind of salary you have. So this is going to increasingly occur. There's also a differentiation among types of institutions and a widening gap between the haves and have nots of institutions of higher education. Did you know that the 40 wealthiest institutions of higher education account for two thirds of the wealth of higher education, right? So it's a kind of, not quite the 1%, but it's a similar kind of uh, framework. The article discusses many issues and incorporates startling statistics, including the rising cost, including achievement gaps between ethnic and racial groups including a supply-demand mismatch that is regional. So the area of the country that's going to see the most growth is in the South, especially Texas. And this is really important because of the high number of Latino, Latinx students, right? There's also, um, they talk about the kinds of learning formats and pathways that may change. For instance, the concept of university for life, boot camps, short-term training, badges, certificates, and so forth. But especially, again, germane to our conversation today, they talk about changes in three areas. The academic workforce, the student body, and ways that we will do teaching and learning. So faculty today and tomorrow. There is a growing prof 
graying of the professoriate. Baby boomers like me, born between 1946 and 1964, at many institutions among tenure track faculty, we, com we comprise 25%. And many of them are us, <laughs> are approaching 70. And in 1978, that number was only 8%. Moreover, um, in terms of race, we also see that primarily white, in terms of those numbers, and that the higher up you go in the academic org chart, the more you see men, white men, um, and you see gender and racial differences. And anytime I point out statistics like this, it's never meant to say anything against or for anyone who occupies those roles, right, those spaces. But it is very important for us to be aware of them as we think about the way forward. Um, and so I have the specific facts data, but I don't need to share those with you other than to say, right, they're stark. Also, there's a bifurcated faculty that they talk about, which is that you have most of the tenured faculty are older and staying much longer. There's a Chronicle article that says <coughs> retire already, right? And I'm like, no, thank you. I love my job, right? And that finally, you know, the salary is better than ever. You know, if I told you what I, anyway, I wouldn't, but. I mean, in terms of what I first made. So again, it was fascinating to look back on my records and so forth and see how far I've come along. But a challenge exists because so many faculty are staying on uh, who have been around for a long time and have a certain amount of salary that that influences the overall salary pool that contributes to really relying heavily on non-tenure track faculty to the extent that in many institutions, almost 50% of the uh, teaching folks are non-tenure track. So this has lots of implications. Now let's move on quickly to look at students today and tomorrow. Where there's a shifting potential applicant pool, the main market is still 18 to 22 year olds, but in 2014, the nation's student body from K through 12, you heard this, right? Majority, minority, racial, ethnic groups, huge. Even as there declines, the numbers of students in certain areas of the country those are tied to race. So places in the country that have been accustomed to white students being the main persons who come to those institutions, uh, because the numbers of white students are declining demographically, then they're not going to have that pool from which to draw. There's also, and so these trends are important because they tie to attainment gaps. And those are pretty startling and stark as well. How many of you are familiar with those in the state of Colorado specifically? If you're not, you need to check them out. They are troubling, and they are attainment gaps specifically between white students and Asian students for the most part, for the most part. We've got to be careful of, of generalizing, by the way. And one of the things I suggest is that we disaggregate our data. So we look even at white students. We look at students who are also first gen. We look perhaps at students who are rural. So these are complex issues, and oftentimes we just throw out these broad data that I think miss an opportunity. And it's really unacceptable because we have the tools to do that kind of disaggregation. But it's almost like that idea of access. If we don't know what to look for and think about. We might just kind of go with the status quo. So um, attainment gaps, and uh, again, there are so many of them, and I'm closely running out of time. Let me just tap into one. So the graduate attainment rate for high school has gone up to 40% of the population. 25 to 64 years old have a degree. The rate for blacks is 28%, for Hispanics is 20%. Moreover, there's a 45 percentage point gap between the share of wealthy students and poor students who complete graduate degrees. A great source for this data in terms of Colorado is coloradosucceeds.org. Org, right, which gives you dismal rates across K-12, P-20 in terms of a variety of ways of attainment. So um, there are other, also other identity categories we've got to be thoughtful about in addition to race and gender. There's also age. There's also a growing, um, which I'm very pleased about, quite frankly, a person who are LGBTQ, of, de de defining, of, of, of rather, um, 
saying this is who they are. There are, we have to think about international students, think about veteran students, think about students with disability who now are being mainstreamed in K through 12 and aspiring to go to college. So there's lots of things in terms of thinking about students. This for me is something that is a, a really important perspective as we think about uh, where we might be headed. As we think about the importance of this convergence I'm proposing of those of us who are interested in teaching and learning technology, those who are interested in diversity, who are interested in these larger trends. So you look to see, that's our faculty, and as I said, most of them are white, and that most of them plan to delay retirement, if ever to retire at all. At the same time that these are the students, right, right now, with the new majority and minority, and that's going to increase. What does that say? Here's something I don't see anybody talking about. Those students are our prospective professoriate. And what, if anything, are we doing that makes that appealing, attractive to them, and so forth? And I, as you can see, we could go in many directions with that alone. And if we had time, I'd, I'd actually ask us to think about what are some other implications of that, as well as what's something to get excited about what we might do with some sort of intergenerational approaches to what we do, as I've alluded to earlier. So I really need to wrap it up. There are phenomenal, I have five minutes left? Or no, four minutes? Okay. So <laughs> phenomenal trends. Um, one that I found very fascinating was that although the MOOCs have not kind of taken off as people may have seemingly, as people may have thought, what has happened is they have shifted the conversation about teaching pedagogy and how to better assess student learning. Because the kinds of things faculty tried to do related to being successful in MOOCs got them to do more in terms of thinking about teaching and learning and how they do what they do. Moreover, there's really now um, an increase in many institutions for positions like um, at, you know, centers for faculty development, et cetera. And by the way, that, so there's data that show that that's one of the hottest jobs. To that I would add another hot job is chief diversity officers. And all of these are responsive to things that are going on in the world. And I'm very pleased to say on my campuses, our new uh, Center for Faculty Development director and I have forged a partnership along these lines. And she's created a fellowship for one of our phenomenal uh, education faculty where she's going to be engaged specifically in helping faculty in terms of more culturally responsive teaching. We also had on the Denver campus our student leaders request through our faculty governance group, actually they submitted a resolution that said we would like all faculty to get training, I was like, don't say training, faculty don't want to hear that, um, <laughs> professional development on culturally responsive because those students recognize, and by the way, for all students, not just, it's a course over here that's just about diversity, but all faculty understand how to engage effectively and humanely with a wide variety of students because those students get it that that's going to help them as they go out in the world. So, got lots more to say. Um, the other thing, though, is big data. And I will close with that and not say too much more about the future, but this is pretty significant. How many of you have heard about what they're doing at Georgia State? So you need to find this out. Very briefly, data analytics. So. Um, Georgia State serves several demographics that American higher education has largely been failing. 50% of the university's 32,000 students receive federal Pell Grants, 60% are not white, 30% are first gen. At this university in downtown Atlanta, those students in defiance of national trends are more likely to graduate than white <laughs> students. They have 16 different programs focused on student retention and graduation. They've created a culture where numbers matter. And what they're doing is focusing on what they call the murky, students in the murky middle. Because a lot of times our efforts are for students who may seem to be failing or students who are excellent. And so they've really succeeded by resources there. But guess what? Not only does this do the important work of graduating students and graduating a wide variety of students, but here's what it happens is the university saves, are you ready for how much it saves for every 1% improvement in retention rate? You want to guess how much? $3 million. 
for every 1% improvement. So if you're not compelled by anything else, that bottom line is pretty huge. And they anticipate hitting a graduation rate of 60% by 2021. So as we think about the future, we think about where we've been and where we might head, it's really important that we think and feel about a lot of the kinds of issues that I shared and what's implied within them. I encourage all of us to become much more thoughtful, much more heartfelt, much more committed in terms of all that we individually and collectively have to offer this phenomenal opportunity to make a difference in higher education and therefore in the world at large and therefore, quite frankly, in our own quality of life and work life. The excitement, you know, to be rejuvenated for some of us who are part of the older professoriate. The excitement of fully engaging and involving all of our students in a variety of ways. The excitement actually of also being very much more thoughtful than we have been about including staff. Because one of the things we also tend to do in higher ed is talk more about students and faculty than anyone else. So in closing then, I, again, you can tell I'm a little bit excited about this, right? <laughs> I'm geeked, actually. Um, and I really do believe we can do better. And I know, I know that there are different kinds of resources and promising practices. And my gosh, you know, we combine what we know if we invite other persons to the conversations and vice versa, there's lots of progress we can make. And there I have, and I think these will be available for you. I have recommendations at the institutional level, and I also have recommendations at the individual level. And if you don't know what the platinum rule is, I encourage you to find that out, leave a little mystery, right? Um, and, and what I encourage is we practice the golden rule and the platinum rule when it comes to how we do teaching and learning. And on that note, I again invite you to pause and think about maybe this session is one where you got one thing that you learned. Actually, I hope you got like 25, right? It's like, why think so low with just one at any rate? I encourage you to think about that, and I also genuinely hope that as we develop ways that we're going to continue this conversation, so one idea, that we really will proceed with some sort of shell where we can gather all the resources. And by the way, all of this is even possible because of technology itself. Isn't that kind of fascinating? And yet it goes back to the notion of access. It goes back to the notion of motivation. On that note, then, I really appreciate your time and your energy, and I look forward to moving forward. Brenda, thank you. Um, so we don't have time for Q&A, but I'm sure if you all like rushed the stage, Brenda would answer your questions. Um, uh, but lunch is served now. Again, thank you very much for being here, and thank you, Brenda, for an inspiring keynote address. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to do this, huh? Yes, we are.